Thank you all so much for joining us. We are honored to have you here. I'm Luciana, a first year MBA student at Stanford, and I'm a team member of the Brazil at Silicon Valley team. And I'm here to introduce you to our session, AI, Machine Learning, and Big Data in Healthcare. This panel aims to evaluate how technologies such as AI, ML, and Big Data can improve healthcare services in general, and Brazil in specific. In this sense, this panel, this panel aims to give an understanding of which technologies have the highest potential of impact and best fit for Brazil's needs. For this discussion, we will have David Glazer and Dr. Negan Shah, moderated by Fernanda Tovar Mall. Dr. Negan Shah is an Associate Professor of Medicine at Stanford University an executive member of the Biomedical Informatics graduate program. Dr. Shah's research focuses on combining machine learning and prior knowledge in medical ontologies to enable the learning health system. He holds an MBBS from Baroda Medical College, India, a PhD from Penn State University, and completed postdoctoral training at Stanford University. David Glazer is an engineering director at Very Life Life Sciences, and where he helps life science operations use cloud computing to accelerate and scale their work with big data. He is a PI for the Data and Research Center of the NIH All of Us Research Program, and he serves on the NIH Advisory Committee to the director. Um, he previously worked at Google, where he founded the Google Genomics team and led a variety of platform, product, and infrastructure teams. Prior to joining Google, he successfully started two companies. David grew up in Massachusetts, where he earned a BS in physics from MIT. Dr. Fernanda is currently president director of the Dora Institute for Research and Education, which she co-founded in 2009. Her current research focuses on functional and structural brain connectivity, brain plasticity, and neuromodulation. She is also an adjunct professor at the Institute of Biomedical Sciences and at UFRJ. Fernanda earned her MD and um, PhD in Morphological Sciences at UFRJ, was a postdoctoral fellow at the National Institute of Neurological Diseases and Stroke. Please join me welcoming the Dr. Negan Shah, David Glazer, and Fernanda Hall. I'd like to thank the organization and all the volunteers to be able to, to make this possible. So, we're going to talk about AI and machine learning. We know that the, the use of this in healthcare is becoming a reality nowadays. Um, medical doctors and also other healthcare professionals, students, managers, and also uh, patients are already facing this reality. To talk about that today, we have here two excellent experts that will go over in the beginning. Um, uh, with some, we'll talk about some slides, and then we are going to have a conversation. I'd like also to encourage the audience to make questions. We will try to coordinate between the devices here and to be able to um, answer your questions as well. So please welcome Dr. Uh, Glazer and Dr. Shan. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the organizers for inviting us. Yeah, um, we're going to start really with a very few slides. I have two short slides, and then has one long slide. And so, but, but, but we wanted to set a little bit of context, and and really the context was around data and health and what the, the opportunities are and their and the motivation behind all of the things that we do separately and that we see is what's exciting about health uh, health and data coming together. So the first slide, I, I call this the dystopia for vision. 
And this is the default. This is the default view of what will happen to data in health. Because data is generated in all these small end situations. It might be a patient having a one-on-one -on -one encounter with a doctor. There's data that comes out of that encounter. And it tends to go into a silo of n equals one. Or it might be a small trial of hundreds or thousands. Or it might even be a large cohort trial of 100,000 or a million. But each of these, by default, are small end silos that generate their own data. And then we wish we could get knowledge from it but it won't happen by wishing. So the next slide is a, uh, actually the challenge that I was given on the next slide was lay out your vision in 140 characters. This was right before Twitter doubled their size. So, um, so, so, so in, uh, I'll, I'll talk you through it in English. The t first line is the default. The default is we're gonna have all these small n. Well, we want to be able to learn from big n. We want to be able to learn from a large accumulation of data. That puts us in the world where all the, the last 20 years of data science and consumer tech and machine learning have all evolved to say, give me big data and I can find knowledge in that data. So if we can set up the healthcare system to actually generate large amounts of analysis ready data, that will allow us to really generate the knowledge about human health that when applied at scale, goes a little back to where we started will actually improve health of all of the people from which the data came. So that's a framework. It by itself is a motivating, motivating framework. It's a reminder of why there's an opportunity and what we can accomplish when we set things up. And then the work is, how do we do it? So I'll stop there and I'll take it. Uh, thank you. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? So uh, when most people think of data, the image that comes to mind would be a table, for example, with rows and columns, or pictures, images, or sequence data. That's the three most common things that come to mind when you say data, particularly in healthcare and, and in medicine, obviously. Uh, but what I want to convey in this one slide is what's showing up on this slide is how I want you to think of it. I know it's blank right now, so if you hit the down arrow, so think of a timeline, and left to right is the progression of time uh, as you're looking at it, and these gray dots are when things happen uh, to someone that are relevant to their healthcare. You might get the flu, you might get a vaccine, uh, you might get fever, uh, you might get allergies, you might have something more complicated, and so on. And then uh, one more, down one more. Depending on who is measuring, there will be some version of what happened to you recorded in some fragment of the health or allied ecosystems. So you might have some disease codes recorded, you might have some medications, that's the second row uh, in green, you might have some procedure codes, you might have some x-rays and MRIs. In the US, typically you will always have a bill associated with it. There might be some screaming data if you were in the ICU and had a pulse ox and an EKG monitor attached to you, or if you're using a beta bill, for example. I think median time people use a beta bill 70 days, so after that you kind of lose that data screen. Uh, and then somebody somewhere will say the word genome, so you'll have that measurement at that point in time, most likely from your chief. But you could measure genome from a whole bunch of other places. Uh, tumor DNA is one place where you actually have sequential measurements of genome over time as the tumor metastasizes and so on. So this is on one human. It's not a table. And there's no one person, not the patient, not the hospital, not the insurer, that has all of it. Nobody. And then just hit down data once more. And then we have this on data on, on multiple people as a, a maybe go to the big M. And so the challenge in healthcare is to imagine this data object in all its glory with all of the different data streams. There could be 50 more rows in here, your social media stream and, and your walking habits and battery habits and so on. And then do something with it that either improves the science of medicine as an understanding of disease, the practice of medicine as in what happens in a doctor-patient encounter, or improves health care as in the delivery of care as a business or as a nation to its population. So I'll stop there as a framing context and then we'll go on into our questions. Thank you.
you, thank you very much. So, yeah, I would like to start maybe with a bit more general question for both of you. So, um, what those new technologies will influence or change the doctors and other healthcare professionals' role? How can we actually combine human work with all this technology and what are the challenges that we have to take on? I'm happy to jump in. That's a large question, so I think we can each nibble at different parts of it. I think I'd start by splitting it up into in the moment of interaction and, and before the interaction. And they're both very fruitful areas to explore. So in the moment of interaction, what, you, what I would be aspiring to with technology is technology that gets out of the way, right? The first wave of technology in the doctor-patient encounter is well known to be intrusive and stands in between me and my doctor, which is not actually helpful. Um, so I would look for, I guess metaphorically, I would look for an augmented reality approach instead of a, you know, instead of an alternate reality approach. And I think uh, there are, what, what I want when I'm seeing a doctor is for him to have better information about me and better, better context about me and better suggestions of things that he might not remember to think about or to ask me about. And to, to do that. So that's what I'd be looking for in the moment. And that's not so much a deep data experience in the moment. It's much more, I, I would be working with the human factors people. I would be working with people who are building building the, uh, the assistance out there that you can talk to various devices in your life and have them give you information back. Uh, that's the area that I think will have the most fruit in the interaction. I don't do anything in that area. I have, I, I, no more than say, I wish for me. The, the other side is where I think data technologies can really have a tremendous effect in, on healthcare is by improving our understanding of health, by just improving the, 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 the picture that we have and the understanding that we have of what are the different factors that influence health. I was once, I was once told, uh, that, I'm trying to remember who from, but if you want to know why, you know, what keeps you up, why you get sick, there's three answers. It's, it's uh, bad habits, bad genes, and bad luck. Okay, that's useful, but I would hope that my doctor could actually bring a little bit more to bear in deciding how to treat me and my family and all the people in my, in my country than, yeah, well, change your habits, too bad you were born to the wrong parents, and yeah, you got you got unlucky, right? That's that's not helpful. And and there's lots of places, and the, the, the word that tends to be used to describe all those places is precision medicine. I think it's a word that is both deeply correct and somewhat overused right now, and so it's way back to being deeply correct as we actually pick it apart and say, what can we be precise about? Where can we get the information? And where can we use that to understand how to treat you differently from you, differently from you, because we have the pictures of what matters at scale. So I'll build on that. I won't repeat anything. In my mind, the main question in front of uh, doctors and in front of the healthcare system is we have all of this information, the pretty picture with checkerboards I showed you. Uh, at a given point in time, if technology gets out of the way and everything is synthesized, so what? Like, what is the effect or harm? We can do a lot of risk stratification using historical data and figure out that my risk for event X, Y, Z is you know 23.2%. So what? What are we going to do? The action side of the equation is the part we need to start paying attention to. Like I often joke in class, predictions that don't change actions are useless. Uh, you can make weather predictions all day long, but if the people don't remember to carry an umbrella when it rains, you're still going to get soaked. Uh, and that's the part that the health system and doctors and, and physicians need to appreciate, that these things from data will give us an alert, which we all hate if it shows up as an intrusive alert. The form of that alert will now change to be something in the background, it might be color, it might be a nudge, it might be a text message, but at the end, it is still an alert, a message to you saying, given all of these data and these 50,000 similar people, we have figured out X about you. So what? What are we going to do? How will we act on that information? That, in my mind, is the most important thing. 
or health system for Iraq? Great. Actually, we have some some um, questions from the audience, and I'm trying to combine because all of them uh, touch the same points. Talking about data collection, how can we deal with biased data? How can we deal? How big enough is the data that, that can be really useful? And how can we collect that useful data respecting, for example, patient privacy? Can you talk a little bit about that? The many people are asking similar questions. So, I often find that people confuse uh, security, privacy, and de-identification in one conversation. And for the most part, what people want is, when you use my data, it should not be used to discriminate against me that manifests itself as a privacy concern, particularly in the US. But what I would do is turn this question around and say, if you want your care to benefit from everybody's data, do you not have a moral obligation to share your own? Like otherwise, how can you expect to benefit from the millions of patients of data if all of those millions want their own data to be private? Like we got a, we got a pretty big problem here with this picture. So to the privacy concerns, I would say what we need to solve for is trust. But we make the conversation not about trust, but about privacy, about security, and about the identification. Yeah, I, I agree with those thoughts, adding, adding a couple. I think, and, and I liked your, your, your anchoring it in the, the a moral imperative, and I think there are a couple of moral imperatives. There's one that you cited. There's another one, which is, uh, and this is actually, uh, it's act in the United Nations uh, Charter, the list of human rights. One of the fundamental human rights that the United Nations uh, embodied is a right for every person to benefit from scientific knowledge. And that, in order for that to happen, you have to make the data useful. You have to create that vector arm to make it useful. So I think anchoring this question it's, it's not sufficient, but it's necessary to anchor the answer to the question in why are we trying to make large amounts of data available? And we're trying to make them available because that's how we're going to improve each and every individual's life and, and therefore collectively the population's health. So that's where it, I completely agree, it has to start there. And whenever, um, you know, a, a small thing, Verily, when we were starting Verily, put in place, as, as every, every responsible company does, put in place a compliance organization for all the different regulations that we had to, had to, uh, to document that we complied with. And right from the beginning, we said, we're not going to call that the compliance team. We're going to call that the trust and compliance team. To just remind ourselves, every time we sat down or got an email or read a document, what the fundamental purpose was. And then compliance is how you document that you do indeed earn and deserve the trust. But it has to be rooted in why and in the trust that you can build up. So I think that's a foundation. We could spend the whole rest of the session talking about a lot of the how. Um, I'll just maybe drop out, toss out a couple of the things that are important on how you collect the data. Um, one is you have to find a way to to, to motivate all the different groups who could benefit from the data to be part of the process. And that's partly on the, on the healthcare system, and it's partly on the outreach. Uh, in the United States, there's a, the, the, the abbreviation we use is UBR, underrepresented in biomedical research, and there are certain populations that are very well studied. If you are a white European, and in particular if you're Ashkenazi Jewish, we have a lot of data on you collectively in the, in the global healthcare system. But if you're not in one of those populations, if you are rural and you're not from a European background and you're not in the, in the upper socioeconomic tier, you, we know less about you. And that's a, that's a global we. That's a, you know, medicine knows less about you. And in different countries, the specific UBR, the specific underrepresented biomedical research groups will be different. And it takes extra effort to bring all of them into the picture. Um, and there's lots of reasons why that's not just good for the underrepresented populations. That's good for all humans to get a fuller picture of what it means and what the variety and diversity of human biology is. Um, and then there's a whole set of 
get scoring, but critical things about how do you harmonize data, how do you collect data in a way that makes it useful downstream, how do you set up the various access rights so that you can continue to deserve the trust, all of that. We won't go into the details, but that builds on top. So can I add something to that? So you, as we, I mean, I, I imagine there's a whole bunch of entrepreneurs in the room. Uh, how many doctors in the room? Just quick show of hands. So when you enter data, please make sure you enter correct data. Don't take shortcuts. Uh, <laughs> but as we talk about trust and privacy and collection of large data sets, typically the conversations evolve around solving for incentives or solving for trust and compliance. Uh, there's an underappreciated idea which is solving it by technology. And for entrepreneurs, that might be more interesting. There's a lot of interest in machine learning on encrypted data. And there's a lot of interest in newer paradigms of machine learning that do not require this much of data. And both of those are very promising avenues or technological solutions that may reduce the size of the problem in terms of how much data we need. Yeah. Can I have a follow-up question, though? Um, are we preparing this generation, the future generations? How are we preparing the, the or how can we facilitate the incorporation of those technologies um, in different aspects? What are we doing or what should we do? So, for those of you who are doctors, uh, when my dad's older brother, uncle, uh, went to a medical school, who was four and a half years in India, and the textbook of physiology was about this big. Uh, in year 1995, when I started med school, it was about this big. And it's still four and a half years. And like three more subjects got added. And now we're adding awareness and literacy around data and algorithms onto the medical curriculum, which is still four and a half years. So it's not going to work. The solution to that, every time a sufficiently complex technology comes into medicine, a new specialty is born. Primary care docs don't do MRIs themselves. They don't read histopathology slides themselves. There is a board certified subspecialty called clinical informatics. I think it's underutilized. Historically, people trained there get shunted into running and keeping and getting and feeding for Epic. But I think we need to use their skills to do biopsies of databases and produce evidence that can be used in the care of uh, other humans. So I, I, I had two, two thoughts to that. Um, I'll, I'll give you sound bites to define them. Uh, practice up to your license and bilingual. So practice up to your license is exactly why not having primary care physicians do MRIs makes sense. And the same should be true around as data tech gets added in, is structure things in such a way that the people who are the data experts are really spending their time working with data and people who aren't are able to consume the results of that without necessarily themselves needing to know how to, uh, to, to tweak the R code to generate a better visualization of the data that will help their patient. So that's that. The bilingual bit is, as I started working in this space, I had zero experience in life science six years ago. Right? I had no background at all in that. I, was, I had been in the, the software space all along. And, and I started a team that was job was to do genomics at Google. And how do you do that? Well, you do that by first recognizing what you don't know, and that's true on people coming from both sides. Second, by, by recognizing it's a, that everyone should become a little bilingual. You all speak more English than I speak Portuguese. That's all. As a room, we are a very bilingual room. We could probably take any five people here and have a conversation that spanned English and Portuguese very effectively. If you're building a team to work on data in healthcare, make sure that the team at a fairly fine granularity is very bilingual and that everyone on it is a little bilingual. And also talking about uh, impact on individual cases, um, can you talk a little bit about precision medicine? So how does are changing and the impact on that? Um, yeah, so that's a I'll, I'll start with, I'll start with a, again, a motivating example. I forget who I first heard this from. But imagine if you went to the optometrist and said, I'm having trouble, I'm having trouble reading, or I'm having trouble driving. And they said, oh, OK, here are reading glasses. See you next, see you next year. Or here are driving glasses. See you next year. We would, that, that's laughable, right? Of course we expect when we want to have 
correction for our vision to have somebody come in, precisely measure the characteristics of my eyes, and based on that, to design and manufacture a precise intervention just for me. Well, today, when I go to my doctor, he does the usual checkup, and then he says, so, you exercising regularly? How, much you, how many fruits and vegetables are you eating? Good, good, see you next year. Right? And, and on the one hand, that's very good, right? There's nothing serious enough going on with my health this year that, that he needs to do anymore. On the other hand, there is a, that, that is at the level of, oh, are you take, are you, you know, do you wear reading glasses when you read? Do you wear driving glasses when you drive? Great, see you next year. So the opportunity is we know we are all dramatically more different. We know we are different in our genetics. We know we're different in our microbiomes. We know we're different in our lifestyles. We know we're different in, in what we have built up in our bodies over years. We know we're different in the environment we live in. We know we're different in our exposures. We know, we know we're, we're dramatically different. And we know we respond differently to all sorts of medications, to all sorts of interventions. And yet, we don't know how to put that to work. That's the opportunity. That's, the, that's what's exciting about precision medicine. And then the practical trick, getting back to, OK, so if I'm an entrepreneur trying to do something, or if I'm a healthcare system trying to do something, where can we carve off the first piece of that? Where can we find a place? Well, one of the first places the healthcare system found it was precision oncology, where instead of saying, oh, you have a tumor in your lung, we'll treat it with lung tumor medicine. Oh, you have a tumor in your, on your skin. We'll treat it with skin tumor medicine. Oncology has moved to, oh, you have a tumor. Let me look at that tumor, understand the molecular mechanics of what it's doing, and treat it according to that. That's a good step. That was a step that we knew enough, we understood enough to take that step. Awesome. Where's the next one? Where's the next one? Yeah, talking about examples. Can you both provide uh, maybe some um, good examples of improvement in efficacy or patient care? And so, I, in my simple-minded thinking, uh, I I try to break things into science, practice, and business, as I alluded to. The example David just gave is where molecular understanding, the science of what is the tissue of origin of a tumor has been translated into actual practice saying, if your tumor originated in this and this area, we're going to treat it that way. But in order to get this adopted, there's still a third, a second step that needs to happen, which is to figure out how to pay for it. And until you figure out the payment modality of something at a societal level, Either society or your insurer, depending on the economy you're operating in, uh, innovations do not get adopted. So a lot of times, people will invent something that indeed provides better care, and it saves money. But it saves money for the wrong person. And then you have no way of capturing that and reducing the overall cost of care. And so that part of bringing things into the clinic is extremely local and governed by the local ecosystem and incentives under which uh, things operate. At least in the US, it's really important to figure out who will pay for this, and most important, why should they pay for it? Because otherwise, we're just increasing the cost of care. The majority of cancer innovations have improved survival by two to three weeks and have increased cost of care by half a million dollars. Not sustainable. Yeah. Um, I'll add maybe one more category of examples, which is pharmacogenomics. And the area, the, the idea that certain medications, we actually do understand enough about the pathways to know that if you have a particular variant, you will either metabolize that medicine better or worse or faster or slower. And therefore, it's a good or a bad idea to, to treat you with it. And there are a few very, uh, very clear examples of where it's black and white of that making a huge difference. There's many others where it affects care. One I just heard about recently was uh, uh, Thailand, over the last few years, had a massive success in public health. There's, uh, the doctors are going to correct me on this, but I think there's a, uh, I think it's called Stevens-Johnson syndrome, is a, a, a terrible uh, condition that can happen. Uh, where basically your, 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 
your whole, all of the skin on your body falls off as if you were burned, uh, and you die. So it's, it's terrible. And, um, and it can be caused by giving someone a drug that they don't know how to metabolize. There's a family of drugs that are used for some very useful conditions. There's a simple genetic test that says, are you or are you not able to metabolize this drug? I'll say 10 years ago, Thailand was seeing 1,500 deaths a year, you know, so five a day from this condition. And they dropped it in a matter of two or three years from 1,500 to 500 by putting in place a public health intervention of saying, you are not allowed to be prescribed this drug. The pharmacist will not give it to you until you show them your gene card saying, I've been tested and I'm okay. So that's incredibly efficacious. In terms of it pays for itself. Um, there are more examples. That's just I'll, I'll jump in a bit. So I'll abstract away from that example, and I've seen this in 13, 15 other situations. You go for a scenario that has above 1 in 100 chance of happening. So 1 in 100, 1 in 200, what have you. So Stephen Johnson syndrome, 15,000 in Thailand's population, you know, maybe 6 million, 8 million population. Uh, so it fits that template. It's a relatively rare occurrence. If you can then use data and algorithms, in this case, genetic data and simple variant calling, or in some other case, something else, to get the uh, ratio down to say one in ten or five in ten, as if you were that short, post data and post algorithms, you can then employ interventions using that guidance, and you can employ expensive interventions using that guidance and overall save money for your health system. Seen that played out multiple times. Yeah, so taking those examples that actually worked, and also examples that with things didn't work so well, um, how can we actually transfer the knowledge that we, we have, for example, in one country here in the US, from outside the US, from different markets such as Brazil, for example? I think that the, the category of what I look at is I look for places where Brazil can take advantage of a second mover advantage. And there's a lot of cases when technology is advancing. You hear the phrase first mover advantage all the time. And that's, that's a real thing. But first movers are also the first mistakers. They're also the first people who get it wrong. The first people who accidentally go down a path and say, gee, I, if only I had known, I would have done things differently five or 10 years ago. Second movers get to skip all of that. Second movers get to learn from someone else's mistakes, which is always a nice thing to do if you can, if you can pull it off. Um, so what I would do if I were looking at transferring learnings from the US to Brazil is yes, I'd look at the successes and say what's working well here, but I'd also look at the places where people say, gee, if I could do it over, and you can do it over, right? I'd look for those. Uh, I don't know where they all are, but I would certainly, uh, in the area that we've been discussing here, around the use of data to improve health, I would say look for the places where you can put in an infrastructure, a societal infrastructure that says, that puts in the right uh, moral and ethical thinking about data as a national good for the national benefit, and say how can we do that? Put in place the policies that allow you to use the data in conformance with that ethos, and then put in place the, the technical framework to say, yes, we are designing everything that happens in health in our, in, in our country so that that data becomes useful for anyone who wants to use it to improve the health of our country. And there's work to do on all of those, and there's examples of people who are doing it well, and people who say, in hindsight, I wish I had. That's where I would look. Yep. So clarify who owns the data. There are very few countries in the world that actually have a law that unambiguously clarifies who wants to their health care data. And second would be to put in place an incentive from day one to ensure data liquidity. So clarify ownership, ensure data liquidity, market incentives after that will take care of a lot of bad things from happening. Yeah, I have some, I have a question here from the audience that was voted and that they, well, um, what parts of the traditional healthcare system are more prone to disruption? So that is, I'll, I'll, I'll start with, a, with, a, with what I would have said five years ago when I was just getting in and why I was wrong. And what I would have said is it was the 
places where the, the technology felt cumbersome. Right? I would have said, let me look at the user interface that a doctor is dealing with when they work with an EHR system and say, oh, well, clearly I can disrupt that. I can build a better UI than that. I would have been right on the fact that I could build a better UI than most EHRs provide to their doctors. I would have been completely wrong that that was a good opportunity for disruption. And the reason is, um, to, to, the, the reason is because you have to back off and look at the whole system and say why why is the UI crappy on a lot of those uh, on a lot of EHRs, and then understand that there's incentives and there's motivations and there's structures where that it, it wouldn't be you wouldn't get uptake if you just came in. With, and then I back off and say, okay, where can we do things that are more fundamental? And you know, I don't have this. I don't have. I'm not going to give you specific answers, but I would say look at the incentives. Things like Megan was talking about about if you start to think about what are the incentives around data. Right? If I wanted to disrupt healthcare, I'd look at where are there places where you can take one of those loops of of input and action and, and, and intervention, and where can you disrupt that? And that's where I, where I where I look for deeper ideas. I completely agree. I wouldn't look at what technological skill you have to find places to disrupt. I would look at where are the incentives misaligned that you can disrupt using the technology you might have in your back pocket or something that you would invent specifically for that. The commonest mistake in healthcare innovation and disruption is that somebody solves a, a technology problem beautifully and have now not thought about the market or the incentive problems uh, in healthcare, and then it just falls back. So now I, I will move for a more technical question, but I think that's very important, especially in Brazil where we don't have many di digital data from patients. So it's a question from Susana Martins. What's the status of natural language processing to extract rich data existing in nodes? So it depends on what language. <laughs> I don't know the state of the art in Portuguese. Uh, and it also depends on what kind of thing you're trying to extract. Uh, I often joke in class that clinical text is not amenable to natural language processing. Because you would do apply natural language processing on language that is natural. Uh, clinical text is a haiku of acronyms. Uh, with about 30% of the things stated in the negation. And I don't know if regular English prose where 30% of those things will be stated in the negation. So it is its own beast. But you can process the text without calling it natural language processing to extract things that you can then use in your downstream data mining. The good news is that new diseases, drugs, procedures, and devices don't come on every week. And the list of those entities is finite. And if you turn the problem around from natural language processing to extraction of medical things from the content, it's a much simpler problem, and you will produce the raw material that will drive your data mining algorithms or your AI much more efficiently. Throwing vanilla NLP is probably not going to work. Yeah, completely agree with that. Um, combining that thought with the previous thing about disruption, there are a lot more clinical encounters in our future than in our past. And it might be, this, this is one of those long shot ideas that's either crazy or transformative, up to you to decide. It might be we should ignore all of the notes that have ever been entered, because they're crappy notes. Just, just throw them away. And instead, let's put our work into creating notes going forward in a way that both serves patient care and downstream data. And there could be tools that are, that are part of the data entry process, part of the capture process, uh, that, that, that actually are thinking about notes as more than a don't sue me field in the EHR, which is what they mostly are now, and into a useful field. And if we get that right, who cares about unnatural language processing? It's all in the supply side. Okay, now um, talking a little bit about diagnosis and management of patients. How those technologies can increase engagement of uh, patients, patients' engagement in chronic disorders uh, in terms of diagnostics and management? So, 
I'll first, I, I think the answer is, um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna fall back on that phrase of practice up to your license, and it's a phrase we, you've all heard many times, but I think if I as a patient am dealing with a chronic condition, I want to be armed to provide, to practice up to my license and be part of my own care team as much as possible. And, and what it takes to do that will be different depending on who I am and what the condition is and, and, and many other things. But I think technology has a lot of potential to give me, who I care more about my health than anyone else does, um, to give me the tools I need. And if you give me tools that are 5% better, but I'm 20 times more motivated to act on that, that might be a pretty big lever over giving my doctor tools that are 50% better, but he sees me for minutes a, minutes a year. So, um, so, so that's part of what I think about, is how can we provide the patient the information that they can use to take better care of themselves. The other thing I would say, though, is I would never try to say, instead of me as a patient interacting with a caregiver. I would never say, oh, good news, we now have a chatbot that can, that can take care of your health. I want the chatbot and I want the person on the other end. And there's been some, some interesting work that Beverly and others are doing around how can technology help expand the reach of a health coach so you can have a human being who cares about my health and is helping me take care of myself and that, that the, the, the scale factor you get by adding the human touch and the chatbot or whatever the equivalent is mixed together, I think is, is where technology can make a big difference. Um, yeah. So um, I think that we have only, yeah, more five minutes. Okay, so I will jump for a more uh, general question too. So we have here in the audience um, uh, top management of uh, largest uh, healthcare companies in Brazil. Um, what would be the recommendations in terms of strategy uh, to incorporate um, AI and machine learning in, in, in their strategic visions? Uh, what would be your advice and what should they expect from the, those investments? So, the most important thing I would say is don't think about AI. I'm not joking, I'm not joking the slightest. A healthcare company or a health system cannot afford to think technology first. First figure out the what you're trying to solve, and the why, and then the how will fall in place. It could be that AI might be an over-engineered solution for the problem you're trying to solve. And just because you use AI is not going to make the incentive problems and the what and the why go away. You can't wish those away. So if you're in the C-suite of a health system or a health insurer, do not create a task force around how can we use AI. Create a task force around what are my top 10 problems and is AI or machine learning a plausible how for any of those? I agree, what I'd add is that I think is something that is, is worth investing in, which is a precursor, is data. And is, if it is, is measuring, the, the, measuring the inputs and outputs that are relevant to the operation that you're working with and having that data available. And then I'd add to that, to echo a couple of Nigam's earlier points about incentives and access, I would find a way to set it up so that your hospital or your healthcare system your region, however you're organized, becomes one of the juiciest data sets that the people who are the AI geeks and the health data geeks say, ooh, I want to work with your data and really tune my algorithms and develop the next generation and try out an insight. Because all the people that I know on the software side are starving for good data that they can use to advance the tech. And if you create yeah, you know, the, the, the old saying about you can't herd cats, right? You absolutely can herd cats. Move the cat food, right? Cat food for data geeks is data. If you can provide the best, where best is quality, quantity, and accessibility, if you can provide the best data, people will come to you and say, please, can I help you understand your data and use it 
to come up with insights that will help you with your business. So I'd say that you can do, but don't start with the AI. And if they come to you, first question to ask is the incentive question. Because if they solve it and it doesn't make money for them, they'll go away in three, four months. Thank you. Thank you again. I think that we, yeah? yeah also, yeah, thank you again for uh, the, to be here to join us. And I think that we all, I hope I enjoyed a lot, and I hope that you all enjoyed as well. Thank you. Thank you.